All right. Um, welcome to another installment of Maddox Time. The exciting thing about this installment is we have our first guest. Um, earlier this week, we had a chance to sit down with Andy Blow, who's the um, the founder of Precision Fuel and Hydration. During our conversation, uh, we, we talk obviously about what Precision Fuel and Hydration is and how it's more than just uh, a product of electrolyte drink and, and sports nutrition. Um, but we talk about the importance of knowing your sweat data, um, knowing you know what nutrition you need on, on training and race days, uh, and we use my numbers as examples. Um, and we also talk about, you know, how properly fueling and, you know, I guess lack of fueling can affect your performance. It can affect your mood. It can, uh, it can affect your cognitive function. Um, a lot of the things that I'm, I've actually been thinking a lot about lately, uh, since my crash, um, because one of the things I realized when I did crash in December, uh, well, I guess I didn't realize it at the time, but I was trying to think through a lot of like, why did I go down? How did I like make this turn? And like, suddenly I was on the ground, really trying to think about what my state of mind was during that, uh, during that descent. It was at the end of a four or five hour bike ride. The sun was setting. Um, the conditions were no different than what I'm used to up there. But I think the fact that it was at, you know, the end of a really long day of training. Um, and I remember thinking, like, I'm, I'm really hungry. Can't wait to be home. Uh, I'm sure a lot of these thoughts, like, are, you know, stuff we all think about as athletes. Like, you know, at the end of a long ride, you just want to be home and you want to eat. You want to get on the couch and do nothing. Um, these are the thoughts I was having at the end of that ride. And I think, like, because of all of that, uh, you know, I was distracted I let go of, you know, the, the basic technique of descending, um, and I went down. And I, I think a lot of these things can actually be solved with proper fueling and proper hydration just to keep your mind sharp, to keep your, you know, to keep yourself in a good mood so these things don't come out of nowhere. And basically, I guess what I'm trying to say is the, the fueling and hydration keeps your shit together. Stay tuned for that conversation. Um, it was really cool to, to sit down and chat with an expert. So I guess it's been a while since we've done one of these, and it's been even longer since we've actually put out like a, a Freestyle Tribe video. Um, the reason for that is Jenna was on a surf trip with her dad in Nicaragua. Don't blame me. <laughs> um, I said no to the trip because I didn't want to be out there with a broken arm watching jenna and her dad surf all day and then when jenna got back she got covid so yeah it's it's been a minute we are healthy now though so we're gonna start to um ramp things back up and i guess the the last reason that i wanted to chat about in our last like sit down with this is um our videos take a lot of work and i'm sure a lot of you you know watch watch our videos and get a sense of like the um, the editing and production work that we we put into each and every video, each scene. We want it to be a certain way. We want these videos to tell a story. We want them to be entertaining, and I, you know, we do it for ourselves. Like Jenna and I genuinely enjoy making videos. She has a background in production and media studies. I have a background in documentary filmmaking, and we sit down and we like enjoy putting this content together, um, not in a way that's just like you know, uh, selfish or like, how can we profit off of it? How can we get sponsors? But like, because we genuinely enjoy making this, these videos, it's our creative outlet from what we do day to day. Um, and it's really our opportunity to like step away from triathlon actually, and think about something else that is our hobby. We want to make them entertaining, but I think beyond that, we each see ourselves getting better and improving at filmmaking and making videos each time we make a video, um, which I think is really, it's a very fulfilling hobby when you have goals and, and you can see yourself getting better at it as you do it. So um, I guess with that being said, you know, it's, uh, it's cool when you all appreciate like 
uh, the production quality and, and see the hard work that we put into these videos. So, um, so thank you for, for recognizing that. And we'll, uh, we'll keep up what we're doing and keep getting better. Um, training updates. That's what's next. A lot has happened. I'm trying to think back between like the last time I sat down. I think the last time I sat down was right before I had my six or seven week follow up with my doctor and uh, he took x-rays and said everything is looking phenomenal. Um, he looked at my collarbone, which is the bone that he repaired in surgery and said he couldn't even tell where the break was. Um, it is 100% healed. Uh, my scapula that was scapula dust at one point is pretty much completely glued together and you can't tell where that dust started or ended. There is one break that is still visible in x-rays and that's still what we're paying attention to. It's in the scapula, um, but already it's like really calcified and healing really well. So he gave me the thumbs up to go swimming. Um, so since then I've done a couple swim sessions um the first swim session like felt embarrassing like my first lap was like the ugliest thing i've ever seen myself do in a pool <laughs> i know i'm super grateful to like be a swimmer and to you know be in the water for 45 minutes and to get my stroke together within that one session and now it's just a matter of like continuing my pt getting my full range of motion back um, and then starting to incorporate more like workouts and strength in the pool and my swim will be back. Um, I think the whole goal for this year is how can I get by in a competitive pro field swimming twice a week, um, maybe three times a week leading up to races, but I want to be super careful this whole year not to overdo it and not to stress things out of my shoulder to the point of I'm going to, you know, have long-term damage. So the, the goal this year is to just make sure everything heals 100% properly so I don't have any issues in the future. Um, so twice a week swimming. We'll see where that gets me in a professional triathlon field. I've also been riding outside. Uh, my first ride outside was with my family, um, just super casual and, and really fun, just enjoying the hills out here. Um, and uh, since then, I've done more outdoor rides. I did an 80-mile ride this past weekend. Um, and I've gotten multiple flat, t I think I have a 50% flat tire rate right now from the rides I've done outside and it's kind of depressing. Um, so hopefully that's enough for the whole year and I won't have to deal with it ever again. Yeah, I mean, in terms of training, everything is still like super low volume, I guess low-ish volume and very low intensity. Um, as I continue the rehab, I actually am off to uh, help put together my brother's bachelor party. He's getting married next month. I'll be off this weekend, but then when I get back from from the bachelor party, uh, really going to start kicking training back into the gear that it was in before the crash, which is really exciting. Um, I think over the last few weeks, I've built up like this strong base, this strong aerobic base where I'm confident that if I put more intensity and put more load on my body day to day, um, my body will be able to handle it and actually respond well to it. That's really the biggest training update is like what's to come because we've reached this point where the worst injury stuff is behind us and it's all about starting to push it now and, and seeing where that takes me. The last thing I want to chat about, I guess like through these chats, we're in this theme of like this intersection of, you know, training your body physically and training your mind and like what that intersection of those two types of training looks like because I do both obviously I train my body every day through swimming biking and running and PT rehab but I also see a mental coach Dr. Jim Taylor he's local here in Mill Valley uh, but he, he coaches a lot of professional athletes a lot of professional triathletes uh, he's a triathlete himself like you know, nationally recognized triathlete for his age group. And I also, you know, work with a really wise uh, triathlon coach who drops these little nuggets of information, these little nuggets of wisdom that I am <laughs> very receptive to. I write them down immediately and I'm like, oh, I got to use that. Um, and one of the things my coach said, my triathlon coach, Craig Upton, said the other day was in response to me talking about trying to be perfect at, like all the time 
and that was me for the last two years in the sport. Um, I would do things to a T. I would look at the TSS. I'd look at the planned volume for the week and try to hit those numbers perfectly. Everything in my training peaks is green. Um, and if I didn't do that, I would almost think of myself as a failure. Um, so me trying to do everything perfectly, his response to that was, don't think about being perfect, but think about the concepts. Think about what we're training for and how we're training for it. I mean, it's pretty clear in my day-to-day -day training, looking in training peaks, like, okay, today is a long aerobic base building day, or this whole week is just focus on aerobic base building. Understanding the concepts and what I'm training for every day um, and taking that and allowing myself to not have to be perfect, but just focusing on that and doing the workout how I please to achieve those concept goals really allows me to enjoy my training a lot more. And it ties into one of the conversations I had with Dr. Jim Taylor a couple weeks ago about the idea of survival versus thrival. And I think he said he thought he made up the word thrival at one point, but I think it is a real word, which he found out later. Um, but the idea is a lot of us like do things in, in a sense of survival rather than doing things to thrive. Because in our, in our day and age, survival doesn't really serve much of a purpose. Like we go walk down to the store and buy our groceries and, you know, we, we live a comfortable life. My training before this year... I, I really did it to survive like that, that kind of like trying to be perfect every day was almost my attempt at like, how can I survive through this workout and get it exactly right? Um, and now that I've kind of freed myself to, to thrive and just focus on concepts and not do the workout exactly how it's prescribed, but going outside, doing the bike ride, doing intervals on a hill, you know, practicing little skills on the bike, um, it has helped me enjoy training a lot more, reach the end of a week and be fully satisfied with what I was doing without seeing total green within a week because there are days where you wake up and you're exhausted and you're tired and you do need to scale things back. Or there are days where you feel really good and you can, and the weather is gorgeous and you can just go for an extra hour on the bike because it, it serves the purpose of what you're focusing on. It serves that concept. So I think allowing myself to you know, express myself outside, enjoy training, doing things imperfectly, but still achieving the, the mission, ch still achieving the concept. It's gotten me through a hard time in training, but it's also set me up, I think, for, for a really enjoyable season of training and racing, um, because these are things I can take into races too. It's like, how can I go out there and, and thrive and excel and, and express myself without trying to be perfect without trying to, you know, put up a wall and protect myself. Um, so that's all I have today. Uh, we're going to go right into my conversation with Andy. Um, again, I learned a lot from this conversation. I think fueling, hydration, electrolytes, everything under that umbrella is really, really important, no matter what kind of athlete you are, whether you're trying to compete to reach your full physical potential or if you're just trying to have fun on any given day, doing something endurance-esque. Um, so stay tuned, check it out. Uh, here's my conversation with Andy. Everything good? Think yeah. so. How's my hair? Yeah. <laughs> better. better than mine, that's why I've got a hat on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, I'm not gonna do your intro justice at all, so I wanna let you introduce yourself, but today on Maddox Time, we have a special guest. So Andy, why don't you take it away, introduce yourself, and talk about what you do at Precision Fuel and Hydration. Yeah, thanks Miguel. I'm Andy, I'm the founder of Precision Fuel and Hydration. Started the company about 12 years ago in 2011, so nearly 13 years ago actually now. We're in 24, aren't we? I've lost a year somewhere. Yeah, good. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I was a triathlete as well. Um, I raced, I raced pretty well in cold conditions when I was a triathlete. I had a few top tens in some Ironman races and stuff. But whenever I went somewhere hot and humid, my races would fall apart. And it was kind of learning about sweat and hydration and electrolyte loss and that there was a big turning point for me in my career and what eventually led to forming Precision Hydration all those years ago. Mm -hmm. And I guess like 
back when you started to realize the importance of it, what did it, like the industry of finding out like sweat rate and sweat data and like the products to accompany that, that information, what did that look like? It was like almost non-existent really. And the, cause the internet, this was when I was having these problems, this was around probably late nineties, early two thousands. There's, there wasn't a lot online. What there was was actually very focused around ultra running. I found some. I found the early ultra running forums really helpful because there was a lot of guys back then running hundred milers like Western States running in the heat, and they knew a lot about fluid and sodium intake. Uh, anything I read about triathlon and Ironman was kind of fairly standard. There was like Dave Scott's triathlon training bible and that yeah. kind of thing. There was no great YouTube. Well, YouTube wasn't a thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So people couldn't do what they can do now, which is follow people like yourselves and like really get an insight. Better or stuff. worse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it was kind of the wild west really in, in yeah. terms of what, how do you find stuff out? Yeah. I actually went to a friend of mine who was a doctor, was my first port of call. And he understood, he was a heart surgeon. So he really understood blood um, sort of um, blood electrolyte balance and those kind of things and identified to me the source of what the problem I was having probably was and then helped me to identify yeah. a solution but it the solution was kind of making your own drinks or yeah. adding salt to in my case adding salt tablets into the mix or right whatever. right yeah. and I I found it like I mean this is before I competed but it, it seemed like there was this phenomenon where you were either good at in the heat or you weren't like there were athletes that could perform well at Kona and then there were athletes that they couldn't and I'm guessing a lot of it was because the products available were like a one size fit all yeah. model right? I think that's that's got a huge amount to do with it because yeah. you're right it was assumed like I was definitely told oh you're just not you're just someone who doesn't race well in the heat and yeah. that, that gets in your head and you just think oh I'm not going to do well in the heat yeah um, and I think whilst there are people who definitely find it naturally, they, they, they're kind of wired up and their physiology suits racing in the heat, mm -hmm. which is great for them. If, if, you, if you're not naturally good at it, it doesn't mean you can't work at it to do well. You just got to understand what you're doing. Right. To take people through a little bit about like our first encounter, like last year was my first year racing as a professional. And I think what a lot of elite athletes are doing now is like they're, you know, everybody is training a certain number of hours per week and everybody is doing similar types of work. So like the, the improvements and the way to beat your competition is like, it's all in the margin. It's all in the detail. And for me, I became really obsessed with like, how can I squeeze out like an extra little bit out of each discipline transitions, like all of those little things. And I think for me, one of the biggest realizations was you know, lactate testing, bike fitting, and coming up with a game plan for like fueling and hydration. And before I started working with you guys, my plan was pretty simple. It was to put, you know, three to 400 calories into a bottle and have some sodium in there and go and, and race with it. Luckily, and I'll, I'll share some data with you, but my sweat rate like my sweat, my actual sweat rate isn't crazy high. Yeah. So I can get away with like a compromised and imperfect plan. Um, but once I started working with you guys and figured out what my sodium concentration is, which is great because it, I mean, getting you tested for your sodium concentration is an amazing investment. And I can't stress that enough because what I learned from you guys is it doesn't change or it, it changes a little bit, yeah. but not enough to make it significant enough to like, oh, I have to get tested once a month or whatever. Um, and, you know, you get that test done, you make the investment, whatever it is, and, um, and then you have that number and you can carry that number with you through your training, through your racing. Um, and once I had that combined with my sweat rate, I not only had like something that was a plan that I could carry through racing and training, but it, it just wasn't a factor in like, it wasn't a distraction anymore. It wasn't like, am I doing the right thing? There is no doubt in my mind that I could go out and race and like focus on swimming, biking and running. And it's like, you don't have to think about these things. You don't have to wonder if you're doing the right thing. Um, so, I mean, you have a crazy high sodium concentration, right? Yeah. So what yeah. you're, the, the point I was going to pick up on there is when you, kind of astutely said that you are relatively moderate to low sweat rate and therefore you have a bit more margin for error in this mm -hmm. so although you need to hydrate you need to replace some sodium when you're racing until you get to really long stuff or really hot races it's kind of not 
as big a factor for someone like you. Yeah. For me, I have a huge sweat rate. I can sweat two and a half liters an hour. I'm one and a half. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, go, so four hours into a race, I'm like four liters down on where you're at, yeah. which is huge yeah. if, if we've got the same drinking schedule. Yeah. And then combine that with the fact that my sweat is super salty as well. So I've got kind of these two, these two things that come together that make me not exactly, a, I wouldn't say an outlier, but just on the higher end of what mm -hmm. you'd expect someone to sweat and lose. It just, it just means that I can race fine for two hours with very, you know, nominal approach to my yeah. nutrition, yeah. like anyone. You start pushing it out to three, four, five hours or beyond, mm -hmm. and it's, it makes all the difference. And if, because the accumulated losses that I can build up over that time mm -hmm. can be massive, if I'm not replacing them adequately, it all falls apart. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, the, that's one of the things that people don't realize around, you know, because when you're racing, we always talk about this three levers thing you need you need calories in the form of carbohydrate, you need fluid and you need salt and you need them in the right ratio for you right. as an individual. And I think what a lot of athletes do, and this is certainly what I did, is you copy people that are more successful than you. Yeah. And then yeah. that's fine in some dimensions, like training to a degree. Training definitely needs to be individualized, but as you've already pointed out, like you take a load of top triathletes and within reason, they're gonna be training in a similar way. They're gonna be doing a lot of swimming, a lot of biking, a lot of running similar amount of hours, like nutrition, totally different between yeah. two different people, particularly on the hydration side. Yeah. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's understanding that, yeah, there's not a one size fits all. Yeah, and I think that's one of the benefits about what you guys do, and I encourage everyone to go check out your website and just the case study page on your website is incredible to go through because to your point, like we all look at more successful athletes than us and try to replicate what they're doing. But you'll, what you'll quickly find out about your case studies is like, Everyone is very different yeah. and you have winners of Ironman races ha having completely different nutrition strategies, which is, you know, brings up the importance of using your nutrition planner too. And like understanding what type of athlete you are, whether you're on the Andy side of the spectrum or the me side of the spectrum and, or the Jenna, Jenna doesn't, uh, is not a salty sweater at all. And it's like, you, those things are important. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, you know, so I sweat, you know, in moderate conditions, a liter and a half. Yeah. Um, and my concentration is 12, 1250. And for a four hour race, it, one of the things that I have asked myself before I started working with you guys is like, do I need to replenish everything that I'm losing? And then as the race goes longer, if I do full distance, like how important is it to like be replacing one and a half liters of fluid or like is there margin for like depletion throughout that yeah and the the simple answer to that is yes there is you're gonna you're gonna finish a race lighter than when you started which yeah. is a marker of fluid loss and you shouldn't try and replace 100 percent of what you're losing throughout the, the entire race you know that's where people will actually do go wrong if they try and do that people always want to know what's the percentage i should replace and it's like very hard to to nail that down because it depends on the duration and the intensity but well, what we tend to look at really is is how big of a body weight loss do you suffer during the race? Because a small body weight loss, one, two, maybe even 3% is usually fine for most people and is, is actually optimal. You start to get up to four, five, 6%. And yeah, there are occasionally athletes that can race well losing a lot of body weight, but really the, the chances of it going wrong start to increase exponentially yeah. after that point. So we usually say to people, if you could weigh yourself before and after a, tr a hard training session or a race and stay within two, 3% of your body weight, you've done a great job with your hydration. And one of the things that I love about like your products too, is like it makes all of this math really easy yeah. too. Like even the water bottles that you have, like I know, you know, that that's just what I use and how I measure my fluid and like the sodium concentrations, you have your, you know, pH 500, 1000, 1500, and then the gels and chews, it's like, you know, you're getting 30 grams of carbs and, and that all that math becomes really simple. Exactly. And it's printed big on the front of the packet. Yeah. So if you have a gel, it's 30 grams of carbs from us. Yeah. If you have, um, you know, if you have, um, an electrolyte capsule is 250 milligrams of sodium. It's just, and you just do the multiples of. I was, I was out running yesterday, it was a warm day, and I'm trying, I always try other people's products because I'm mm -hmm. curious as to what else is in the market. And I tried a, a strong electrolyte supplement yesterday that I'm carrying, and while I'm running, I'm like trying to read the back of the packet, <laughs> yeah. and it tells me how much sodium's in it, but then it tells me 
what the serving size is and the serving size is actually <laughs> three times what it says on the nutritional table so then i'm yeah. doing it, the maths i'm running along and then i'm trying and all the time i'm thinking am i getting this right you know and i work in the industry and yeah. i'm like struggling with that yeah so it, you know f for one of the things for us is the, the process really is like understand what your numbers are mm -hmm. so from a hydration point of view a sweat test and knowing your sweat rate are really helpful in establishing that and then you can work out how many carbs you need per hour and then knowing like i need this many carbs i need this much fluid roughly this much sodium per hour yeah our products are like a toolkit that you can just put that together mm -hmm. and away you go you know we work with um the lotto pro cycling team yeah. lotto destiny they have a little card on their little a little thing on a stem sticker on their bike yeah. with how many units of what they're going to have throughout the race it's super simple yeah. and then each time they have something it's going to add 30 grams of carb right or and I saw a picture of that. It's really cool. It's like literally the pro cycling team has a piece of paper that they tape to their handlebar and it has pictures of your products. Yeah. It's like a, two little chew icons yeah. and it's like that's what they take at hour one. And well, like, you got to watch this yeah. space on that because we're, we're actually at the moment producing some little test ones. Of Going these. more professional. With so that. Yeah, just <laughs> and so because everyone wants them because yeah. I would use one. You know, we're yeah. going to have them on and you can get a stick. Then we're going to have little stickers of the products and yeah. a little time grid and you just stick on what you're going to have when and right. And so yeah, it, like like what we were saying earlier, it just removes any like question or doubt that you might that might be a distraction during a race. Like this is something you don't want to think about when you're competing at a high level or at any level and you're just trying to get through a race, it's like focus on what you're doing, not what you're eating. It's just like, it it should be that simple. It yeah. shouldn't be complicated, no. I guess. But it, but it is because it when is. we do these case studies with athletes, the back and forth that I see from our sports science team with an individual athlete will be, and how many scoops of this did you put in? And then yeah. did you know that that was actually, you mixed that up double strength or you mixed that up at half strength because they've used a different size bottle or, yeah. well, I took three of these and then I put that down and it's like, well, the serving size is not the size as the, as the same as the, you've been reading the bit on the table per hundred grams or whatever. Right, right. So people even, even really organized people who do read the packets and labels and think they know their plan, don't always execute the plan. Yeah. And then you start to throw in other things. It's like, well, how much carbohydrate do you get from a cup of Coca-Cola on the run? Yeah. How much you, you got to know those things yeah. so that you can put them into your mental inventory of what you've had on the, on the go. And I remember having a consultation with your team last year. That was one of the cool things that we talked about is like, all, like you guys have done the testing of like picking up a, a cup off a table and throwing it in your mouth. And you figured out like, how much of that fluid and how much of that carb you're actually getting with each scoop. And like, that's part of the conversation. It's like, well, I roughly grabbed this many cups through the first three miles. It's like, you've figured out like how to incorporate that into the math. And I think like the other thing I want to talk about is like, everyone has like kind of horror stories, I guess, of like nutrition backfiring, like throwing up, pooping themselves on the side of the rope, whatever it is. It's like you, everyone has those stories if you've done this sport long enough. And it's like, you're going to have those moments, but I think it's really important to understand why and like what your nutrition strategy was that led to that. Because I think not enough people know, like, like to your point, oh shoot, I guess I mixed double the concentration. I've like accidentally put scoops of collagen powder in my water instead of, <laughs> that was, that was not a good day. Um, but yeah. I, no, I, I was, I was chatting with a guy yesterday, just a um, local guy. I was sat in a, in a bar having some food. The barman turns out he's a trail runner. We're like chatting away. And he you asked me, I was in a bar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. For just, record, uh, yeah. <laughs> just, uh, yeah. Occasionally I've yeah. been known, I've been known, <laughs> but I was, um, I was chatting away with him and he's telling me he does some really long runs and, and he's asking me cause he finds out what I do. And he's like, then asking me all the questions about nutrition and, and classically, he's like, oh, I just go to yeah, REI, buy these hydration tabs. I just throw one in my bottle. I'm like, how big is your bottle? And he's like, oh, I think it's like 30 ounces or 32 ounces. And I'm like, well, that tablet's supposed to go in probably 16 ounces, or maybe even it's supposed to go in eight ounces. But right. people just don't don't engage with the kind of, you know, and they don't have, not everyone has to, not everyone has to be totally organized about this. But, right. but when it comes to being a triathlete and trying to perform at your best or, wanting to get the best out of yourself like and, and i was as guilty as this so i don't feel bad in saying it but like it's total madness to not understand this aspect of your yeah. performance when it's relatively simple it's like carbs fluid salt yeah. 
the recipe for those three. If you get that right, you are 95% of the way there. Yeah, and I think it's like not just for elite athletes too. This is like if you just want to have fun during your eight-hour day, you know? Like if you're out there for a long period of time, greater than three hours, it's like you should enjoy what you're doing and not have to suffer through it because of nutrition. Yeah. <laughs> well, you and I, before we started, chatting here we were you were talking about cognitive function and that yeah. sort of thing and like i think one of the biggest things is obviously your, your your um your state of blood sugar your state of hydration all the rest of it that all has a massive impact on your mood mm -hmm. and your, your your enjoyment of what you're doing your yeah. ability to perform your ability to make decisions your ability to coordinate you know mm -hmm. if you're tired and low blood sugar you're going to trip over tree roots or yeah. fall down the curb or whatever there's there's so much that it impacts there's, and then beyond that, you've got recovery mm -hmm. because if you don't fuel and hydrate, you know, people probably don't care as much about recovery after races as they should because often you do your big race and then you don't care if it takes you a few days to, to get back into training or whatever because you've kind yeah. of, the goal has been achieved. But getting, getting back into training after a big session at the weekend, if you haven't fueled and hydrated properly, mm -hmm. you are massively on the back foot. Yeah, and to that end, I've like had races where like, yeah, I don't care about recovery as much. And I've noticed that, like, you know, we're talking about cognitive function here. It's like, and, and mood, like, I'll wake up the next day and feel, like, almost depressed that, like, the, the event is over and you've come, your endorphin high is done and everything. But if you do, you know, allocate some energy towards recovering, you're going to wake up and be like, okay, yeah, yeah. not just physically, but just like your mood is going to be better and you're going to be more excited about like what you're doing the next day. Yeah. And, and that's very applicable. I mean, it's applicable to everyone, but especially people who've got families, jobs outside of triathlon, whatever yeah. you, you've got to, you've got to perform, you, you've got to be on your A game on Sunday for the race and then Monday for work. Yeah. So it's not kind of, yeah, it, it, it's, it's not, it's not just thinking about it myopically about this is good for my racing. It's good for everything. Yeah. The analogy that I'll use here is like something that I realized a couple of years ago. But if I'm like sore or something from training, like I used to not want to take Advil until like, I don't know what triggered this, but it's like, yeah, you, you don't have to suffer. Just take some Advil and you'll feel better. And it's the same thing with like what we're talking about here. It's like at the end of a long ride, we've all like gotten in the habit of like, you know, oh, like that suffering is a good feeling, but like you can get pure enjoyment out of what you're doing. You can recover and be ready to go the next day and not suffer just by like paying attention to what we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Endurance athletes are bad for that because we're, we're wired up to enjoy a bit of suffering. Yeah. And then almost it becomes self-fulfilling that suffering is good. And yeah. maybe I get more out of it if I suffer more. But not actually, true. not true. <laughs> not no. true. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I learned that last year where it's like, yeah, you, you, you don't get better if you're suffering every day. Like if you're feeling good at the end of a workout, mission accomplished. Like you're going to be better off. Well, I, I remember years ago being in the position that you're in, like being a aspiring pro triathlete mm -hmm. and building up my training volume and then having to miss. We used to have swim sessions um, a lot of the time swim sessions were early morning like they normally are but there was quite a few that we did late late evening as well when I was trying to build on my swimming yeah but the amount of times that I had to either miss or like I remember once standing on poolside and talking to my, my coach and because I'd got out the swim early and he was like what are you doing I was just I was just cooked absolutely cooked and it was because I'd been out on a long ride that day not really eating anything you know or like I, I remember the feeling I was just like I just, I just had to go and eat some food. I was yeah. like absolutely starving. Yeah. And he looked at me and he was like, you're an idiot, basically. And at the time I thought, maybe he should be more sympathetic. And I look at it now and go, no, no, no. He's like, yeah, I should have, I was an idiot. I should yeah. have just fueled myself properly. Yeah. And yeah. everything would have been better. Yeah. We can wrap up here. I guess, um, where can people find you and your, the information, the resources that you guys offer? Like the the case studies and the fuel and hydration planner that you've yeah. touched on, they're on precisionfuelandhydration.com or pfnh.com. We'll put links. Yeah. Come and see us there. We're on all the usual like Instagram and those kind of things. But you know the team. Everyone's very responsive. It's a team of real human beings that want to talk to you. So if you've got questions about fuel and hydration, yeah. do the fuel planner. 
book a free video call. You know, you can get 20 minutes talking to one of the sports scientists in the squad. We're not going to try and sell you anything. It's just mm -hmm. like, we want to talk to you, find out what you want to do. So yeah. that's probably the best place for people to start. Yeah. And if you see athletes like wearing your gear at races too, like we all like to talk about this stuff because we all have the same like epiphanies when we started working. It's like, oh my God, we were doing everything wrong before, but now we figured it out. So like, you know, ask, ask other athletes about this stuff too. And, and they'll be honest, but no, nope, thank you. No, it's been great. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah, good, and good luck for, for this joining season. us for the trail run. Oh yeah, no, that was a <laughs> yeah. highlight of my trip. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Let us know in the comments if you enjoyed having a guest on, if that was helpful, or if uh, you want more of me or less of just me. I personally prefer more conversations, so I do hope you enjoyed that and. Uh, Hopefully we'll have more guests on. We take requests too. So um, let us know if there's anyone that you think or any type of types of people you think we should have on here. Um, so enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are.